Demet, first of all, could you explain, you've been doing research into the, the problems, the diseases caused by the effects of climate change. I mean, what, what is it you found? Well, the, the work that we've done over quite a long period of time now, about, about 20 years, um, is causing us quite grave concerns about the effects that we're seeing of climate change on the environmental determinants of health. Um, sometimes we can talk about, we talk about specific diseases, we talk about the effect of climate change on heat stress or on malaria or on diarrheal disease, on malnutrition and so on. And these are all extremely important issues. And some of the research that we've done, for example, suggests that even the small amount of climate change that we've seen over the past 30 years or so is already probably causing um, over 140,000 excess deaths each year just due to these small effects. Is that predominantly in the developing world or does it also affect the developed world? It's both. Everybody is vulnerable but we're vulnerable to different extents uh, and in different ways. But it is true that most of the, uh, the burdens, most of the, of the vulnerabilities that we see are, are in developing countries that already suffer from a very high burden of, of infectious diseases which are sensitive to climate or already have trouble supplying clean water or sufficient food uh, to their to their populations. Use the word uh, probably in there. I mean, with the, with the research developing, is that, does that probability increase, the probability that these diseases are linked to climate change? Well, I think there is no dispute that all of the diseases that we're talking about are highly sensitive to, to climate conditions. Nobody argues that temperature and, and precipitation affect malaria, they affect our real disease, they affect malnutrition. And we have pretty good modelling, I would see, pretty, pretty good estimates of the, of the impacts of climate change um, on, on those diseases. We never have absolute certainty, but absolute certainty is unreasonable to expect when you're talking about an escalating risk that you're not going to be able to reverse for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So the real concern that we have, in fact, is not just so much on the individual diseases, but the fact that we see the environmental determinants of health being eroded. We see the problems of drought um, making it difficult for us to supply fresh water to, to populations or, or sufficient food to, uh, to, to populations. We don't have numbers for those. We see enough to be seriously concerned for the future. Which kind of areas, give me some examples of areas where you've carried out your research, where you've seen you know, obvious effects or pretty, you know, almost certain effects of, of climate change? Well, I would say that uh, there's, I can take some new research that's, that's just starting to, uh, to come through now, where, where we have very good monitoring data of basic all-cause mortality in um, sites from around Africa and around the, the developing world. And, and there you, you can see very strong correlations um, between weather variables and, uh, and disease impacts, and in this case, all-cause mortality. We can give you many examples, and diarrheal disease in, in the developing world, again, follows very closely um, temperature and precipitation patterns. And so each time, for example, we see an El Nino event when temperatures go up, we see that reflected immediately in the diarrheal disease in children basically presenting with severe uh, diarrhea and in some cases dying. Um, Pendo, that obviously health is not something that can be taken in isolation. It has a knock-on effect on various other aspects of, of, of daily life. Uh, explain, expand on that a little bit, please. Yes, I mean, um Health is incorporated as well in development. As well, it's about our survival, it's about our future and that of our children and grandchildren. So we're here really to make sure that health is incorporated into the talks and it's highlighted properly because it's, uh, we're, we're doing this for us, for, our, for today, for tomorrow and the days after tomorrow and for later generations. And health is not in isolation, it's part of development, it's part of poverty. If you do not address, you cannot develop with sick people. It's quite obvious, isn't it? We cannot have economic development if our people are sick. Improvements in health has, have uh, improvements also in productivity. And as well as we cannot develop in a sick environment. If the environment is sick, we can't develop either. So it's a much broader issue. It's not just a small issue which needs to be ignored. No, we need to address climate change and we need to do it now. And as Dermot has said, it's quite urgent too. Okay, I mean, is this an issue that perhaps hasn't been taken on board to the extent it should have been in, in previous climate change discussions? And is it something being taken on board now? Well, I mean, health has not necessarily been seriously taken on board, if I may say it that way. But we're beginning to see that um, there was less representation from the health uh, community and of health imp impacts, and that is still the case. However, something that's emerging now is that the health community is much better mobilized. There are plenty of us here, WHO has 
always been, but now we also there, Health and Environment Alliance, HEAL, uh, Healthcare Without Time, and many other people, and medical students also here in uh, Durban. So the health community itself has been better mobilized. However, representations in the climate talks themselves, that's still missing. That's still rather, I mean, it's poor, it's poorly done. So we'd like to see that improved. And not only that, I mean, health is about a positive story. Strong climate change has positive impacts to health, to the economy, and also to the environment. Uh, in Europe, we say, um, for example, the EU's emission reduction target is reducing emissions by 20 percent, 20 percent by 2020. We're saying if the EU shifts that target by 10 percent, reduction of 30 percent, the benefits are enormous. Calculations by Healing and Healthcare Without Harm, for example, show that you can have up to 30 billion euros per year by 2020. That's not insignificant. And this type of information is not included in any of the, neither the talks nor the discussions going on. So something is missing. Thank you. And Demo, what would you like to see come out of uh, COP17 and beyond? Well, I think what we'd like to see is what everybody would like to see. It would be an effective and equitable agreement. Um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also to provide support to protect the, the most vulnerable populations. But I, I very much agree with the, the, the points that, that Pendo has, has raised. The, basically, the, the difficulty that people are having with the negotiations, all, all of the, the, you know, the, the frustration that, that people um, have, that's, that's not the cause of the problem, that's the symptom of the problem. And the, the real cause of the problem is that I don't think we've articulated well enough a, a positive vision of what a... a a, a low carbon economy that provides protection to people actually looks like. And if we just have the vision of towns and cities with clean energy, clean water, effective public health systems to, uh, to protect them, those are the same cities that will also reduce greenhouse gas emissions, save money for the, uh, for the economy and be um, pleasant and uh, health promoting places to live. So if we are able to build that vision and the political will behind that, that, that vision, that gives you then the support that you take into the negotiations. So that's what I think we have to concentrate on, is to, is to really articulate the, the positive vision of a, of a healthy and sustainable society.